Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the CG seminar series on AI in higher education. I'm Eileen Kennedy. I'm a principal research fellow with CG working on education and technology. And I'm delighted to be chairing this session. And today we're going to be hearing from Michael Webb. Michael is the director of technology and learning analytics at JISC, the UK digital data and technology agency focused on tertiary education research and innovation. He's co-lead of a JISC National Centre for AI in tertiary education. And today he's going to be discussing JISC's approach to supporting uh, UK uh, tertiary education sector to navigate the opportunities and challenges of AI. But before I hand over to Michael, there are a few brief housekeeping points to mention. First one is that the session is being uh, recorded um, and will be posted online on the CG website in due course. A transcript of the chat function uh, conversation will also be posted. Please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or ask a question. And there's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do so if you're going to ask a question. Uh, we recommend using the speaker view so you can more clearly see who's talking. To ask a question, use the chat function and write out the question you wish to ask. At the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, you'll be invited to ask it directly yourself. When you are invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. So now I'm going to pass over to Michael for today's CG uh, seminar. Hi everyone. I'm actually unmuted. That's a good start. So good to be here and talk to you all. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully you can all see that now. So um, what I'm going to do today, it, it's in two parts, really, the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start just talking a little bit about JISC and our AI work um, in general and giving an overview of the kinds of thing we're doing. Um, I suspect a lot of you um, won't know much about that. And then in the second half, I'm just going to um, run through a little bit about how we're framing the discussion with our members. Um, so this will be more of a, the kind of thing we do when we talk to groups of people about AI and want to get them thinking about it. So let's kick off about JISC. Um, so you've heard about what we do. There's a lovely picture of our Bristol office where I'm based. It doesn't look like that in real life. Um, so we're a not-for-profit organisation and all of the universities and colleges in the UK are members of JISC. So we provide a wide range of services, things like network connectivity, um, licensing, data services. Um, but I work on a project called National Centre for AI and Tertiary Education. And this is something that we started about just over two years ago in JISC. And at the time, we were concerned that our members were perhaps um, needed help accelerating the adoption of AI and to help people do that in a responsible way. Obviously, a lot's happened since then, and perhaps um, acceleration isn't our main issue. Um, but we decided to take a very um, hands-on and practical approach to this. So we've got four main strands of our work pilots, information, events, and community. And I thought it might be interesting if I just share um, examples of some of those with you now. So I'll start off with the pilots. So this is something we do, first of all, to help us um, evaluate new and emerging AI applications, but also to give our members experience of implementing AI and thinking about the processes and all the things you need to do. So what we aim to do, we aim to run three pilots a year, each with about five to 15 participants. Um, and typically we aim to get something that perhaps we could make more widely available if it's um, successful via the JISC licensing team. So I'll quickly explain the process behind that, and then I'll go to something more interesting about some of the pilots we've actually done. So we look in two directions at the planning stage. We've Part of the team spend their time looking outward at 
applications that are coming in and aim, aiming at the education space, evaluating them, looking at them, looking if they might be useful. On the other side, we look at the kind of things that colleges and universities are interested in, and then we select one where there's a match between the two. We put out an expression of interest to our um, mailing list, so that these are people who have joined the AI Centre community, it's about a thousand people now. Um, we explain what people will need to commit to do it. We pay for the licenses, but we don't provide any financial um, support other than that. It's in time and then um, select a few institutions, pilot it, evaluate it and share the results. And on our website, you'll be able to see the um, results of the first six that we shared. So I thought it might be nice to have a look at some of these. So I'm going to quickly talk about three of them. So the first one is um, grade. Now, the um, starting point of this, we just to say, so this shows that it's not all about generative AI. Um, I know that ChatGPT um, has been the main discussion point over the last year, and I'm going to talk about lots of ChatGTP related things, but there's lots of other interesting AI stuff happening at the moment. So GRADE is a tool that actually came out of um, some work by University of Birmingham postgrad students and it aims to accelerate the marking of STEM subjects. And it does it in a quite interesting way in that it learns as you mark. And then when it comes across something similar to something you've marked before, it makes a suggestion that you might like to make the same comment. So this does two things. First of all, it speeds up the marking process. And secondly, it makes it more consistent. I think the reason that we were interested in this is that um, there's a lot of talk about AI and how it can reduce workload, how it can help with marking. And we think this kind of hits a sweet spot of keeping the authentic voice of the person marking it because it's your feedback, but automating the process. So um, this is a early stage application, um, the um, feedback we got on it was great. And you know, if you're interested in this, talk to, talk to Grade. Next one um, is one that's at the intersection of VR and AI. Um, this is Body Swaps, and it's a tool to help students prepare for interviews. Um, so employability, obviously, a, a core concern in many of our institutions. And the way this works is you go into a VR space, you um, take part in an interview, and the AI does things like watches your hand movement, the speed you speak, um, eye movement, that kind of thing, eye contact. So it's not analysing the quality of your answers, but it's looking at how you present yourself. And it gives you some um, feedback after that. So for me, it always tells me I'll wave my arms around too much. So I'm trying desperately not to do that now. Um, and then you get the interesting bit, the body swap, where it gets its name. You then swap places in the VR and you can watch yourself and see yourself as the interviewer um, saw yourself. And you can kind of say, yeah, I'm waving my hands around too much or whatever. So nice tool there. And lots of colleges in particular are um, adopting that at the moment. And the last one now we are into um, generative AI space is something called Teachermatic. So this is a um, fairly new application aimed at helping um, reduce workload for teachers that uses generative AI. So the teacher, the people behind Teachermatic worked with um, teachers to um, come up with something they call generators, which are tools that use generative AI to do everyday tasks that um, teaching staff need to do. So these are things like lesson objectives, glossaries, all that kind of thing. Um, you might think, or you can just do that with ChatGPT. And that's true, but Teachmatic solves a couple of problems. First of all, it means that not everyone has to be super good at prompting to um, get what you want. And secondly, it resolves issues around, um, practical issues around things like licensing and terms and conditions, because um, you don't have to get everyone to sign up to ChatGPT. So this is one we're doing a more of a longer term study on. So we've done an initial one month, um, what's the reaction to the tool? And then over the course of the year, we're going to be looking at what its impact is. So um, that one's ongoing at the moment, I think about eight colleges. We targeted um, further education specifically with this one, um, just because that's where we were getting more feedback around these particular things. But I think 
we've got a lot of interest from HE as well. So we'll see what we do next with it. Um, so that's just a flavor of our pilots. As I say, we've done a few more and we're planning for next year. Um, next, I'll just go through some of the information type things that we've done. Um, so when we launched the center, the very first thing we did was create um, a landscape report of the state of AI and tertiary education. And we tried to make this um, a kind of broad introduction to the subject. So we talk a little bit about what AI is, how it works, um, ethical considerations and guidance, then move on to use cases and case studies. And the approach we've done on this, because it's fast moving, we've um, updated the report each year um, so that it remains a kind of single up-to-date or relatively up-to-date resource. So we've just published the third edition of that about um, a week ago. The other thing we did at the kickoff um, was publish um, a guide, um, a pathway to responsible ethical AI. So um, this was done with um, our colleague, Andrew Cormack, who some of you might know is no longer with us, but he was a fantastic um, person working at the intersection of kind of ethics and law. Um, and it it's really aimed at decision makers, um, people thinking about whether to use AI and ask some basic questions to get you started. And we'll be reviewing this one again shortly in the light of um, generative AI, but the core concepts are sound. Um, we produce things like, um, we produce a generative AI primer and on all of these, when you put them out, what you really hope is that it will have some kind of impact otherwise, um, What's the point of doing it? So we're really pleased that this guide um, was linked to by the Russell Group Universities when they published their um, principles for AI. And they noted that, um, that the work by agencies such as JISC and the QAA were helpful in helping them understand the opportunities and considerations of generative AI. So um, that report again is one that we're updating um, quarterly actually because it's changing more quickly but um, hopefully useful as a starting point. We're also very keen on collaborating with our members to create resources so this is an example of one um, we had a group that was kicking off looking at creating um, a um, resource to help people understand assessment ideas um, one of the colleagues on the group was from um, UCL, actually, and they'd already started some work there that was very similar to what the group was thinking. So we joined forces, um, and that is now available on the GISC website as an interactive PowerPoint. And we want to do more of that because there's no point inventing the wheel. The more we can share across the sector in terms of practical guides, the better. One of the things that we do, um, if you just want to keep track of our work, is we publish our information um, regularly on our blog site, Just Involve. And we've taken the approach, because we want to get stuff out quickly, creating nice, polished versions of the report takes time. Um, so we put things out on our blog site first, and then those that um, makes more sense, we create more formal versions later. And that ranges from um, stories about university to advice on um, and by some guidance on things like policy, full range of things. And then um, the other thing which is um, quite popular, when we first started talking about AI, and perhaps things have changed a bit now because people are using um, ChatGPT and have perhaps got more hands-on experience, but two and a half years ago when we start thinking about this and we were talking to people, we realised people had a real problem differentiating AI and magic which might sound strange, but people were suggesting um, things for AI to do, which we're nowhere near doing. But they're also sometimes just discounting things. We thought, right, the best thing to do is to create something practical so people can try AI. So we created a site called Explore AI, which has got a whole bundle of um, demos of AI type things that you can do. Um, and we carry on updating these. So it's got generative AI examples now. And they're generally either from cloud providers like Amazon or Azure or things that we created ourselves. And there's also a map of AI in FE and HE. So interesting things that are happening and people submit things to us all the time to go there. Um, and 
what we ex um, encourage people to do, and we use this at events a lot, is to look at kind of the raw idea, think about how could it be used in education? How does it work? And also think about what other issues, like what bias issues does it ar um, arise and things like that, to try and use it as a tool to help people think more broadly. We've also just released a couple of training courses. Um, these are short MOOCs, so these are freely available to our members. Each one is very short. They take about an hour to go through, um, again, covering the core kind of stuff that I was talking about. So one around the ethics and one around um, a general interaction to generative AI. Um, one of the things we do that perhaps it takes us longer than it should, but is getting involved in national policy development and um, calls for evidence and so on. So um, things like the AI white paper, um, Department for Education looking for evidence on um, the use of generative AI, that kind of thing. So we respond to that and try and take a view across the sector to provide something helpful. And the bit that can quite often go horribly wrong, public engagement and talking to the press. Um, but we think it's quite um, important that the wider public are engaged in the debate as well. We run events. Um, we used to run lots of our own. Then everyone else started running AI events as well, like this, which is fantastic. So um, we shifted. We, we join in everyone else's events and only run our own if, the, um, if there's a gap. So we're running a few next week. Um, sorry, next week. Next month, looking at things like AI and medical space and some of our pilots. Um, but we join in with lots of other things as well. And then our community I mentioned, we've got about a thousand people. I'll put the details on how to join. It's via a disk mail list later. We put out regular newsletter. Um, we calls for participation in various things like our task, for fit, task and finish groups that I mentioned earlier. So we've got a few groups and the idea behind these is they produce practical resources like that one I showed about the assessment ideas. Um, and also the group helps us with student panels. So we're really keen that students are involved in the debate and the discussion. Um, we've worked with a number of universities to have forums and groups um, discussing with students what their concerns are, what they um, want to get from AI, and we've produced that into a report. And we're going to do more of those. Um, the ones we've done so far have been with undergraduate. We're going to do some of, with um, postgrad students as well. So that's a quick whiz through the work that we're doing. I thought now for the second part, I would um, just run through how we are talking about AI when people come and ask us to talk about what they should be doing. Um, and this is, this is kind of just one of the ways we're doing it, but I thought it might be useful to share. So it's around the idea of AI 2028, just because people normally pick round years for this, don't they? So I thought I'd be awkward. Um, there was some logic to this. Um, it's been five years since the release of GPT, um, so it first came out in 2018. Um, what lessons could we have learned by looking back over the last five years and what are the next five years going to be like and what are the actions that we take today, how they're going to affect that future? And we've got our nice kind of enthusiastic um, utopian view there in our fake news slide. Um, and I just want to run through this. So 2018, um, GPT was released, the first version, um, uh, as a research paper. So it wasn't something you could try itself, but it had a paper. And not many people took much notice of them, just people that were super interested in AI. Um, so perfectly acceptable that none of us took much notice when it was first released. But 2019, we got the first kind of sign of things to come. So GPT-2 was sort of released and two things happened. First of all, it got a lot better. And secondly, OpenAI um, declined to release it fully to the public, citing concerns about malicious applications of the technology. Now, I think there are two things that we perhaps can spot from that. First of all, there was actually something genuinely interesting happening with the technology. It was starting to do something new, but there's also something to learn about hype. And I think this still resonates now when we are seeing large companies hype that AI is going to you know, 
take over the world and things like that. They were doing it back in 2019. It's part of the technique to get people to take notice. And it was quite good within the community um, that were interested just in AI. It worked quite well. Um, in 2020, we actually got the first public wave of hype. So GPT-3 was released and the newspapers hooked onto it. And I think they did it largely because they could see that it was perhaps going to um, affect their livelihood as writers. So we saw um, a group of articles come out in the press saying a robot wrote this. Um, don't like AI being um, compared to robots, but there we go. And the hype this time kind of was pretty short-lived. And it was partly because the articles had slightly exaggerated the ability of GPT-3 at that point. They cherry-picked the content, put it together. But actually, if you'd followed the trajectory between GPT-1, 2, and 3, you could see the direction of travel and where it was going. And perhaps, you know, collectively, we should have started really taking some serious notice then. Um, the first really serious warnings come, I think, in 2021 with the seminal paper, Stochastic Parrots, by Emily Bender and colleagues. And if you read this, they've really kind of outlined all of the challenges that were facing um, both within education. So they picked up about it, writing term papers, um, social media and all of that kind of thing. And we would have really been in a good position to start planning in advance and getting ready. Um I guess all these things, by the way, it's easy to say with hindsight. So I'm not saying this is a, is a blame type thing on ourselves or anyone else, but it's just interesting to look back and, and see what we might have missed. Um, we all took up and um, started taking notice in 2022, obviously when ChatGPT came out. And what I want to do now is just kind of run through what's happened over the last um, few months, because it's been incredibly difficult to perhaps keep up with the kind of things that are happening. So first of all, Gentive AI um, has expanded way beyond chat. So we've got multiple chat services. The one that perhaps I think we shouldn't underestimate just because it's coming to students, it's well in their space and they talk about a lot, is Snapchat's um, GPT-4 based chat service. And we know a lot of students use that. We know it's moving into search, image, code, um, writing tools and content generation. And I'm just going to show one of the content generation um, applications because it's quite interesting to see these if you haven't. Um, the rate of applications is, is growing enormously. So there's a site called Futurepedia. And on that, on the day, and it basically tracks new AI applications. And um, on the day I made this slide in June, there were 27 new AI applications. I checked it um, midday yesterday, about 11 have been added. So it's way more than anyone can possibly keep up with. Um, some of them are relevant to education, some aren't, but it's creating an interesting space where it's really impossible for any one person to get an overview of what's happening. Um, it's getting integrated into everyday tools. So Microsoft have produced some really nice videos of what it's going to look like in Copilot. We don't have firm dates when that's going to happen, but I managed to sit next to a Microsoft person at an event yesterday, and they told me to look at in November for some announcements. So this is coming soon. Um, it's already there in Google Workspaces. And this obviously is going to change how we actually think about AI in or joint of AI, because we're not going somewhere else to do it. It's there in front of us in our space. Um, so it came out, or the starting point came out in Google Docs in June. And if um, things are going to plan, yeah, they are. I'll just run a, a short demo if you haven't seen it. So. Um, I've just gone to a new document and it starts off by saying, help me write. Yeah, this kind of changes our um, relationship with the word processor. It's not a blank page anymore. It's saying, help us. Um, and um, I'm just going to ask it to write an intro to an essay on education, on AI and education. Um, so completely within the word processor, it's going to weigh and come up with something. And I keep meaning to speed up this video. Um, so there we go. But also, um, I can take it, I can refine it. So I'm just going to ask it to shorten it. 
um, because it looked a bit long and it'll come up with something and I'm happy with it and I'm just going to put it straight in my text. So you can see that you know, our relationship with this kind of technology is going to change and we can't ignore it because it's going to be there in our everyday tools. ChatGPT now has, or ChatGPT Plus has got several hundred plugins. Um, this, this might not sound terribly exciting, but these kind of things change the way generative AI work. So we, we perhaps all got comfortable with the idea that generative AI hallucinates, comes up with false information, isn't a reliable source. Plugins change that approach because they pass on your question effectively to a third party. So they can pass it on to something like Wolfram Alpha, the um, computation maths and knowledge engine. It will then come back with something that is authoritative, um, is correct. And it's different to just using Wolfram directly because you can still then chat with chat GPT. You can start exploring topics. So we can't really dismiss it and say, hey, it's not going to be a truthful source because when it starts getting um, integrated with other applications, those that changes. There are lots and lots of content creation applications appearing. Again, this is moving it beyond um, just text. I just want to show you one that um, is just particularly fun to look at. This is called Gamma, um, and it's a presentation tool. So I'm going to say, make me a new presentation. Um, I'm going to say that I want it to be about AI and education. Um, so there we go. I'll give it the title. It goes away. Um, it's going to come up with outline. It's pretty good, that outline. So I'm just going to carry on, choose the uh, look of it. And off it goes. And it's quite fun to watch it create the presentation. And you know what? It is a pretty good introduction to AI and education. I think if I'd have given that presentation today, um, you wouldn't have spotted that I'd used AI to create it. Relevance to this education, partly um, discussions at the start of the year talked about how we could outrun AI in assessment. So um, there are lots of things that generative AI couldn't do. If we get students to do presentations, um, surely AI can't help with that. Interesting stories on Reddit about students who've used a tool like this to create the presentation. They've um, used ChatGPT to write the script. They delivered it. They've got top marks. And um, one of them ended with them saying, and oh, nothing was learned. Now, quite clearly, something was learned. It might not have been the learning aims, um, but uh, um, there was certainly something there in terms of the skills that are required um, or learned to actually deliver a presentation in that way. Also interesting, um, we show Gamma quite a lot at presentations just because it's quite fun. and. Um, Quite a lot of people we speak to then start using it. And I was at a conference last week and people were saying, or well, someone on, sat next to me on the table was saying they'd seen one of my colleagues present it and now they're using it. And what they wanted to know was how to overcome the guilt, which is quite interesting. They, they felt guilty about taking a shortcut to create their presentations. And I think that's an interesting concept because if we're going to use these ourselves as time-saving things, um, we need to you know, know what's acceptable, what's not just as much as, as students do. Um, Bing chat has gone multimodal, which might not sound terribly interesting, but this is again, one of the issues around trying to outrun AI and education. Um, at the start of the year, people were saying we can include diagrams in our assessments so because um, chat GPT can't read them. In March, OpenAI announced that um, they would make it multimodal so it could reach diagrams and it's now built into Bing chat. So here I just uploaded one of my slides from um, one of these presentations and said, how can I improve it? And yeah, it's quite clearly read the chart and given me really sensible feedback. And those kind of advances are just going to continue as far as we can see. If we look at a little bit outside the technology, it's worth thinking about what um, some of the bigger players outside of um, more formal education are doing. I think one of the interesting ones is Khan Academy. So Khan Academy are working directly with OpenAI and they're working with them to create a tutor that 
um, guides rather than give up give answers. Um, it's not available in the UK. We've not been able to try it ourselves, and the um, feedback that we've seen from the states is mixed. But I think for universities and colleges, it's really important to keep an eye on what these kind of players are doing. Um, they're going to be coming in hard after um, into many aspects of education. They're going to be targeting things like lifelong learning, and they're going to be a serious competitor. Um, so we have to think about what it is that we can do that perhaps is different or how we leverage this kind of um, technology. Going further still, I think we need to think about what the approach is to um, regulating AI um, might be. So I'm going to talk about this very much from a UK perspective, if that's OK. But this is going to be um, different wherever you are. Um, and just for this example, if we look at the EU, the US and the UK. So US um, taking a fairly um, neutral approach, I'd say, to AI at the moment. Um, the EU, um, in their AI bill, have classed education as a high-risk activity. And uh, this is probably correct, um, and it puts more onus onto the companies. They have to prove they've tested it, um, has to be on a register, all sorts of things. The UK taking a different approach. Um, so this is under consultation for the white paper, but a pro-innovation light regulation approach appears to be our direction. And I think from a UK perspective, what, do we, what does this mean for us? Um, there are two things that could happen on this, I think. One is that um, it makes the UK um, highly attractive for innovative companies to test um, AI applications. On the other hand, it might make us extremely attractive to predatory um, big tech type companies to move in because our, our um, regulation is lighter. So I think we need to keep an eye on that, see what happens and think about what it means for um, us. I mentioned before that we've done a lot of student forums. And I'll just share some of the things that the students um, pick up as their concerns. I think these are all reassuring. Um, so first is that they want help with information literacy. So they understand that AI isn't perfect, um, but they want help with knowing how to navigate um, trust to the providers and its accuracy. I was particularly pleased to see that students were concerned about privacy and data ownership. Um, I've kind of worked in... Um, data space and education for quite a long time. And so about 10 years ago, it was quite hard to get students interested in the concept of privacy of their data. But so it's really good to see that now. Um, AI detection, there's a lot of concern from the students about this and a lot of myths and misunderstanding. Um, they're concerned about the um, ambiguous guidelines and they're concerned about the technology that's in this space. Um, They've heard the stories about false positives and so on, and are worried about um, how it might be implemented in their institution. Uh, within the institutions and more generally, they want um, balanced regulation of AI. So they don't want big companies to run amok globally, but they want to be able to make the most of AI in their lives. And the same for education. They don't want universities to ban it, but they, they want guidance. They won't be able to use it, but they want clear guidelines. Most of them are happy for staff to use AI. There were some dissenters on this, um, but they want staff to be transparent and they want staff to be com confident. Now, obviously, this is a, a big challenge. Um, we've got an awful lot of staff in our institutions, so we need to think about how we get to that state. They were concerned about equity, so um, equal access and affordability. Um, Over-reliance, really good to know that students were thinking about this. So they want to balance making the most of AI, but they're also worried about how it affects their intellectual development. And they were worried about employability and jobs. And this is both on the angle of um, AI making the um, sector or the career that they were thinking redundant, but also that um, that not being the case, but they need proper AI skills to actually um, get a job in that sector. So looking forward, what 
where might we be in 2028? And these are just some of the questions that we want people to start thinking about. So I mentioned the Khan Academy. Are we in a situation where global AI driven lifelong platforms have started to dominate various areas of education? Um, might sound far fetched, but I think it's a very real possibility. And um, it, you know, might well start in um, some areas more than others. Or alternately, have we harnessed AI like I showed with Teachermatic or um, Grade to um, allow teachers to focus on supporting human interaction and creativity? That's a thing that our um, institutions that have people in quite clearly can deliver that a platform that's just AI based can't. Um, and um, has the impact on um, work been as profound as, as expected? And if it has, do we prepare our students? So I've just picked up a few examples here. There are many more on this. Um, I picked up one from a Gartner suggesting that um, Gentive AI will automate 70% of new web and mobile apps. What does that mean if you've got a career, a planning a career in that space? Um, the study that OpenAI did, which obviously going back to what I was saying right at the start about AI, OpenAI being the masters of hype, so take it with a pinch of salt. But they, I think there's a, some truth in what they're saying. Their methodology was, um, you know, fairly open. But they're saying that nearly twenty percent of workers will see fifty percent of their ta um, tasks impacted. So definitely something there. And last one is has AI improved efficiency or have we just increased digital debt? And I think this is one we need to be really careful of. So digital debt is the concept that at the moment, we have got way more information than we can possibly process. So emails, data, meetings, all of that. Um, generative AI is really good at generating more of this stuff. Um, it can write longer emails, make our, produce our reports quicker and so on. Um, so I just think we need to be mindful of that and not step move to a situation where um, we've used Gentive AI in the wrong way. We are now draining on more information. We instead look the other direction, look for efficiencies rather than volume. Um, said last one, but I lied. Um, Additional inequality, I just want to put some numbers on this. We, we thought about what a nice set of um, tools would be for a student. Um, so in this, we've got Grammarly, which has got its generative AI, Midjourney, um, ChatGTP+, which gives you the latest model, plugins, all of that kind of thing. Write Sonic as a writing tool, Gamma that I showed earlier, and Cite um, as an example of a research tool. That comes to nearly £80 a month. In fact, I did this in June. If I recalculated that, it would come over £80 because some of them have gone up since then. Um, clearly, that's not affordable for many students. And we need to think about um, how we address this. And it's going to be a mix of approaches, I think. So first of all, we need to understand which of these tools generally are impactful. Um, there's not a lot of evidence either way at the moment. Um, we need to think about which tools we're requiring students to use. If we ask students to use ChatGPT, um, does that mean that they need to pay for it? And we perhaps then need to look at which of those we can um, license, which we need to provide some sort of assistance with. But I think it's really important that we don't fuel um, digital inequality. A lot of talk about data, but I think it needs to be moved beyond that into services. So those are the kind of ways that um, we've been framing the kind of things that people um, think about at the moment. There's a couple of extra bits that I think perhaps um, more focus needs to be on now. Um, so the first, there's been a lot of focus on the student use of AI. Um, so we've seen lots of good work, policy development, guidance for students, a lot of discussion about ensuring courses remain relevant, um, a lot of debate about whether our processes are agile enough to actually allow courses to change um, fast enough. I think perhaps the next thing that I'd suggest over the next year we need to do is think more about staff use as well. Perhaps I'll hinted at this, but we're doing some research on this. Um, 
colleague in JISC, along with um, some colleagues from other institutions, looking at staff use of generative AI. And what we're seeing is that staff are very much seeing it as something for process work. So things that perhaps they value less than subject expertise. And these are things like, and I'm not saying this is right, but this is what we're finding, um, things like equality, diversity, inclusion statements, um, ethics information, grant reports, some sort of quality processes, things like that. So I think we'll need to give some thought and guidance as to what appropriate use of these as a time-saving device against something that's actually removing the point of the activity. Um, that's still in progress. It's not published in any way yet. Two particular examples, um, marking. So generative AI is remarkably good at plausible um, marks and feedback for work. I'm not saying that it's accurate. I'm saying it's highly plausible. So we did an experiment within JISC, um, including some recent graduates, where we got AI to create an assignment brief, create the assignment, and then mark it. And the recent grads said to us, hey, you know what? that feedback we've got is actually better than a lot of the feedback we got when our, we were on our course. Now, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily accurate, as I said, but I think we need to be honest that if you're a hard-pressed um, person marking hundreds of scripts, it's going to be highly tempting to um, make use of this kind of tool. So we really need to understand how it's best used, at, if at all, you know, has it got a place in helping with marking and give clear guidelines. And the other one is course creation. So companies like Blackboard are starting to announce these tools. Um, they look really good. If you've seen the video, create a nice course view automatically. Um, if these tools are going to come in, what kind of quality processes do we need to make use of those tools and what guidance do we need to give staff? So that's what I wanted to share to you today. If you're interested in finding out more, that's our mailing list. I will stop screen sharing now. And see if we have any questions. Yeah, or excellent. Comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, the uh, that I thought you know that was illuminating. Really, uh, I learned uh, uh, quite a bit there, and uh, lots of things to be kind of excited about, but maybe also a little bit depressed about as well. So, uh, <laughs> um, I think. Uh, I think we've started to get some uh, questions from uh, in. Um, Emma Jones has um, uh, has asked a couple a couple of questions. So, uh, Emma, would you like to to come in and um, and ask them to Michael? Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Emma Jones um, here. First question was an apologies. I haven't looked recently, but in terms of good practice, templates and examples and advice for staff and students, do you have a repository on that that links off to different websites that we can start taking a look at? Um, we don't at the moment. We are just, um, we've got a working group looking at this and we're actually collating all of the advice and guidance um, across the sector we're about halfway there at the moment and we, we're categorizing what it covers in each one so that because what we don't want to do is give guidance on things that everyone's got um nailed already we're looking at what, where the gaps are and um, so we can focus our effort so something will be coming out probably in the next month or so on that work fantastic and yeah my second question was you mentioned the co-pilot um yeah. assistant in microsoft yeah is that for the education tenants or is that for business? But yeah, unfortunately, we haven't been able to extract, despite the fact that I managed to sit next to a Microsoft person um, <laughs> yesterday and put a lot of pressure on them, details of their licensing. Um, we, I'm fully expecting there to be something there for the education tenants, but um, we've got no firm information on that at the moment. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Hind, uh, would you like to ask your question? You've, you've put a couple in um, into the chat. Or one was sort of combination of a comment and a question. And uh, uh, will you choose what, what you want to ask? Yeah, I, I wanted to know if there's any information about what schools are doing, because students ultimately will come from school and they bring some yeah. practice with them there. And that's going to be maybe a challenge as well. Yeah. To so, them or, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, 
not so just just focus on post 16 education but we're working with the department for education in england who've put out call for evidence on how generative ai is currently being used and i know that they've had a lot of submissions on that um we're part of the group that will be able to um uh, look at that so there will be some evidence on what's actually happening in schools um shortly through the department for education Thank you. Um, so uh, Diana Lorillard has, has got a, a question uh, there. Do you want to? Yeah, there you are, Diana. Go ahead. Yes, here I am. Thank you very much, Michael. That was really um, informative. Um, it, it, but without without having a kind of critical stance towards the AI, um, and we have been getting excited about AI promises for education mm -hmm. for several decades now, and personally I've always been deeply disappointed with what they produce except for Google Translate which I think is fantastic and does open up inclusivity for higher education in interesting ways and, and uh, essentially kind of unrecognized you know people haven't really embraced it I don't think in, in ways that, that could be really helpful for education. Um, I thought your presentation was far better than the one that you generated with the AI by the way because <laughs> it had far fewer words on this <laughs> on each slide and of course it had to have all those words because the person generating it wouldn't know what to say about each bullet point would they so you know it's got to do bad slides anyway um but what it can do is assessment and it can as you as i think some of your um apps implied they can give students support in creating a much better um submission to a human assessor so that if you ask it the right questions and you go through a, a dialogic process, you do some checking and so on, and all of that helps their intellectual development, nothing wrong with all of that. Um, and it does mean that the teacher gets a much better quality um, piece of work to mark, which is, I think, fine. And I think investigating that, that kind of route would be really productive. But then the other big concern is about the carbon footprint. What about that as a cost? I mean, I think the cost to students is, you know, that's important. But that must be massive now with all this generation of analysis and data that millions of people every second are generating. Isn't that a worry? Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is, and we do um, touch upon that in our report. So we, it is something that we thought about. We're not saying a huge amount, but we need to investigate more. Right, if we talk to the companies on this, and I think this is quite quite a complex issue, they will say that we've positioned our data centers in places that we can make use of um, carbon neutral electricity. Um, okay, that's easy to say, but is that just displacing yeah. where what yeah, um, exactly. normal use of electricity? I don't think it holds. Mm. Um, so I think it is a genuine concern. Um, we know that research is happening to um, use techniques that use less data. I think that's a positive step. Um, we know that the um, materials needed in the, um, the cards that um, are used in AI um, use a lot of minerals that are extracted in in ways that we wouldn't wish so I, I think it's a really complex topic and we our ask is that people engage with that and think about it so in all of our stuff that you know because the more people in the discussion about it and thinking about it the better and the students are concerned about it as well actually i think that's good that's important so well, that's um, something yeah I, I i agree with you um i i think it just needs more analysis to be perfectly honest that it's really really hard to actually get um accurate figures on this um no. the recent discussion has been around water use um because quite clearly if you're um using a lot of solar energy creating heat there's a lot of water involved in cooling mm. it as well so mm. um yeah I, I agree with you and it's something that as a society well it's we going to take a lot on. of engineering education um innovation so um yeah. we're going to have to create the students to do that and they've got to be able to think well yeah and not just regenerate previous texts in a slightly different way absolutely thanks very much anyway uh, thank you so uh has anybody else got a, a question um oh yes for the another one popped in the chat i was going to ask a question but I'll, I'll hand over to uh anna aston would you like to ask michael mm. 
maybe too little warning. <laughs> I mean, Anna, Anna's asking um, how universities structure the process of AI integration in terms of strategic plans, teams, and processes. Not not an easy uh, question to answer in a few words. It, it isn't, and I, to be honest, um, I, this is an area. This is. If ChatGPT hadn't happened, this would have been our big focus last year. We developed a maturity model aimed at. Um, helping people um, or institutions work through strategic adoption of AI. We've gone into COVID style reaction mode instead at the moment. We need to pull back. So we're going to try and focus on that again this year. Now things have, I say, calmed down, but um, yeah, we shall see. Yeah, yeah that's um, very interesting. One, one of my team has um, is doing uh, a, a um, master's apprenticeship and his final project was to look at strategy in AI and education he's just finishing that and just literally this day giving me his report to, to read so work happening in that space but no answers I'm afraid excellent can I just I have a question myself and and it's about the comment that you made about um uh you know offering different tools rather than the the sort of ubiquitous uh, chat gpt yeah um i mean it seems to me that that is a more helpful way i mean you said it means that we people don't have to become good at uh, writing prompts mm. although i mean i wonder you know how difficult really is that going to be but it also strikes me that with the different tools, and it's a shame that a lot of them seem to cost an awful lot, but it, it might help with that idea of trust amongst students. I mean, do you think that in the sense of that you're offering a, a tool to do a specific thing rather than to um, regurgitate previous work, as, as Diana put it, you know, rather than to write their essays, you're, you're asking, you're saying, use this tool, it will help you do this particular part of your learning um you know rather than sort of just one tool to to do everything yeah I th so I think there's certainly a, a, a space for very specific tools that are trained on data to help solve a particular problem and there, there's a kind of area research that are advocating that very much I think that we do need to be careful though because some of these tools whilst the front end is aimed at a particular task it still goes off to chat gpt or open ai at the other end so one of the things that we're really keen on is there's complete transparency on what ai is actually used in these tools so you can assess what's actually happening with it and can i just pick up on the prompt complexity i'd recommend everyone have a look at the recent open ai um, educators guide and the example prompts that they're given there that I find incredibly hard to follow. <laughs> they're almost like um, computer code um, in the way they're constructed. So um, certainly basic prompting, I agree with you completely, but the highly steerable ones, they start getting really close to, I think, coding. It's quite complex, some of these. Oh, well, that's so interesting. So, yeah, have now, a yeah, sorry. No, it's, we've got. A, I mean, uh, Hind has asked has put another question in the chat, and I, I see Diana's also uh, put her uh, a camera on, which indicates I think she wants to uh, come back. Um, Diana, do you want to? Do you want to say? Or no? Okay, Hind. What about your question? Yeah, I'm. I'm wondering if you have an idea. If you can foresee what's going to happen with the excessive. I mean, the long term use of these models. Surely that's going to have an impact on the output and and the value of the output. Um, Is that not creative in any way? Yeah, this? yeah. So, so do you do you mean in terms of the fact that if um, AI is generating lots of content, we're going to lose training material for new models in the future? Um, uh, it's quite that was quite an intriguing example of this I saw myself actually and that um about a year or so ago I um just to show how these kind of models could um write rubbish if you ask them to got it to write instructions on how to teach a cat to code and um Bing was then citing that um a few months later as a factual article on how, how to do such, that exact thing so uh, you know this is happening at the moment uh, um, 
humans aren't going to start cre stop creating writing, are they? And stop creating things. I, I'm hopeful on that. I believe that, yes, we might well end up with a lot of blander, more well-written text, but we've been writing for hundreds of years. We'll keep doing it. Thank you. Okay. I did, this is that strangely sounds optimistic the way you said that, but you know it, it was not necessarily. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, it, we've got five minutes left, and Diana's uh, uh, Diana. You, do you want to ask your question? We've got five minutes. We can easily do that. Yeah, I'm. I'm just wondering what happens to all these fabrications that we generate because in testing ChatGPT, I've generated an awful lot of completely false material. And does that all go into the into the, the, the grand collection of texts that, and, and well, then it will indeed degenerate, as as Hind is suggesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm, so there's um there's a debate that that there'll be or a concept that there'll be this golden set of text up until ChatGPT was released that was all human generated, and that will become one of the most valuable artifacts in humanity. Uh, it, it's a really good question, <laughs> and good. nobody knows the answer to it. Um, <laughs> at the moment, ChatGPT well, is choice. going on just stuff up to 2021. Yeah, I mean, they could so. just do it up till then and then stop. Yeah, yeah. It's a choice. Yeah. But how is anybody going to screen out all that rubbish that we're now constantly generating by testing it? Yeah, um, absolutely. And that's why I guess the field of AI detection isn't just about spotting things to stop students um, using it in their essays. It, it's got a big use in trying to filter stuff for future um, models. But yeah, mm -hmm. that is an, an unsolved problem at the moment, as far as I'm aware. Great. OK, thank you. Okay, we were just a few minutes to go. Um, uh, somebody's uh, uh, saying, uh, Karen's just suggesting that she's generated a lot of bad poems, but uh, she's not shared any, so we can't judge that. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, you know, that was really great, Michael. It was really, really, really informative and gave, gives us a lot to think about. Um, I want to alert everybody to next week's um, uh, uh, webinar um, because you know when you're you're talking about like writing writing prompts like coding, then you know that uh, we're, we're the next topic we're moving on to is um, um, uh, AI and academic labor. You know, <laughs> so it's sort of like yeah, it's going to change work. Um, so that that uh, will be. Uh, a, a nice interesting follow-up to this so that's next Thursday at two, two o'clock so I hope people can join us then but once again Michael thank you very much for a great a great webinar thank you goodbye for coming everybody. everyone